Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is efficiency. Our objective is to introduce a common performance measurement known as efficiency. We'll learn to calculate efficiency for single-stage and multi-stage systems. This lecture operates under the presumption that viewers watch the Energy and Power Lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet or only didn't recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. The real world isn't perfect. In the real world, things are hot and noisy, dogs vomit on your homework, and sometimes your lazy lab partner doesn't know what they're doing. The point is, losses will always occur. Due to the inevitable nature of losses, output can never be greater than input. Efficiency is a simple measure of the effectiveness of a system. Given a certain input, how much of this input is directed towards useful output, and which portion is misdirected towards losses. Efficiency is expressed mathematically as the ratio of usable output over given input times 100%. In practice, I tend to drop the percentage because it's cumbersome. Expressed as a ratio, efficiency is output over input. If you need to format the answer in percent, it's a simple matter of shifting the decimal point two places. 0 0.50 equals 50%, 65% is equal to 0.65, and so on. This three variable expression can be expressed graphically with the use of a triangle, with output at the apex and efficiency and input at the base side by side. To calculate efficiency, divide output by input because output is over input. To calculate output, multiply input by efficiency because efficiency and input are side by side. Finally, to calculate input, divide output by efficiency because output is over efficiency. Given a certain portion of input is always misdirected towards losses, it would not be too bold to presume that useful output will always be less than input, never greater. If your calculations result in output greater than input or efficiency of greater than 100%, you are doing it wrong and you need to perform a tactical retreat and reassess your data. Given that energy in a closed system can neither be created nor destroyed, but only changed in form, we can say that all incoming energy is converted into something else and all systems are therefore 100% efficient. This is obviously not what we intend, but we must clearly delineate between what is considered useful output and what is considered a loss. Depending upon the application, one form of energy might be considered useful output and another application the same form considered a loss. For example, heat is the intended useful output of a heater, whereas a motor with the intended purpose of producing rotational mechanical power, any heat produced due to inefficiencies would be considered a loss. Let's try some simple illustrated examples of efficiency calculations. Consider a motor that consumes 2 kilowatts of real electrical power and produces 1.7 kilowatts of usable rotational mechanical power. Let's calculate the efficiency of this system. Efficiency is output over input. 1.7 kilowatts over 2 kilowatts yields 0 0.85. 0 0.85 expressed as a percentage yields an efficiency rating of 85%. This calculation also suggests that this motor is also 15% inefficient, meaning 15% of 2 kilowatts or 300 watts is directed towards losses which might take the form of friction, noise, and or heat. Consider a gearbox, known to be 95% efficient, that consumes two megawatts of mechanical power input. Let's calculate the usable rotational mechanical power output. Output is efficiency times input. 95% expresses a ratio is 0 0.95. 0 0.95 times two megawatt yields a usable output of 1.9 megawatts and the remaining 0.1 megawatts, or more appropriately 100 kilowatts, is directed towards losses. Check your work. Given losses always occur, output is less than input, as we'd expect. While we've got this example right in front of us, what happened to the missing 100 kilowatts? Has it disappeared? No, this power is going towards non-useful output, namely frictional losses, vibrations, heat, and or sound. That's why it's so essential that a gearbox not include just the gears, bearings, shaft, seals, and housing, but also a means of lubricating and cooling these gears. This 100 kilowatts of losses has to go somewhere, and the film of oil coating the moving gears not only eliminates destructive metal-to-metal -metal contact, but also transfers the heat away from the mating surfaces. It's for this reason you'll sometimes see a radiator or heat exchanger used to cool the gearbox oil and rid itself of this heat so the oil doesn't thermally degrade and the gearbox continues to function properly. This also explains why gearboxes are built out of heavy, heavy metal rather than compressed cheese or origami. The housing must be sufficiently robust to absorb and dissipate the losses inherent in its operation. Finally, consider a hydraulic pump known to be 60% efficient 
that produces 1.2 horsepower usable hydraulic output. Let's calculate the mechanical power input in units of watts. Via unit conversion, 1.2 horsepower represents an output of 895.2 watts. Input is output over efficiency. 60% expresses a ratio as 0.6. 895.2 over 0.6 yields a required input of 1,492 watts, or roughly 1.5 kilowatts. Check your work. Given losses always occur, input is greater than output, as we'd expect. Let's now tie efficiency to our previous understanding of energy and power. As you are no doubt aware, energy is power times time. Efficiency affects power. If a device is inefficient, it will use more power to accomplish the same task, and as a result, it will consume more energy. Conversely, if a device is efficient, it will use less power to accomplish the same task, and as a result, it will consume less energy. Often at its most basic level, the tasks of engineers and technicians is to design, maintain, and improve systems so we get more output for less input. Efficiency is priority number one. As a simple illustration of this concept, compare an archaic 100 watt incandescent bulb to a modern 25 watt LED bulb, both of which yield an equivalent amount of usable light, which happens to be 2.4 watts. Let's calculate the efficiency ratings of these two different types of bulbs. Efficiency is output over input. For the incandescent bulb, 2.4 watts over 100 watts yields an efficiency rating of 2.4%. This is pretty awful, because this also implies that the incandescent bulb is 97.6% inefficient. Answer me this simple question. What is the intended purpose of a device which converts 97.6% of incoming electrical power into heat? What else would you call it but a heater? Not only are incandescent bulbs an inefficient source of light, they're highly efficient heaters. Let's do the same thing for the LED bulb. Efficiency is output over input. 2.4 watts over 25 watts yields an efficiency rating of 9.6%. Surprising, isn't it? You'd think it'd be better, but it isn't. However, in comparison to the incandescent bulb, the LED is still four times as efficient. Consider the energy and cost savings of these two different technologies with markedly different efficiency ratings used for the same purpose. Let's say a factory requires 100 light bulbs to light up a space 12 hours a day. You have a choice of using 100 inefficient 100 watt incandescent light bulbs or 100 efficient 25 watt LED bulbs to do so. Consider the annual energy requirements and costs for these two different configurations. Let's say the cost of electricity is 12 cents per kilowatt hour. Let's see if we can determine the daily and annual energy requirements and the annual cost for these two different configurations. If we were to turn on all 100 100 watt incandescent light bulbs in the factory at once, the factory would consume 10,000 watts or 10 kilowatts of power. Energy is power times time. If we did this for 12 hours a day, the factory would consume 10 kilowatts times 12 hours or 120 kilowatt hours per day. Given a price of 12 cents per kilowatt hour, the cost of lighting the factory every day would be 120 kilowatt hours times 12 cents per kilowatt hour or $14.40 per day. If we did this for a whole year or 365 days, the annual cost of using incandescent bulbs to light the factory would be 365 times 1440 or $5,256 per year. Let's do the same thing for the LED bulbs. If you were to turn on all 125 watt LED light bulbs in the factory at once, the factory would consume 2,500 watts or 2.5 kilowatts of power. Energy is power times time. If we did this for 12 hours a day, the factory would consume 2.5 kilowatts times 12 hours or 30 kilowatt hours per day. Given a price of 12 cents per kilowatt hour, the cost of lighting the factory every day would be 30 kilowatt hours times 12 cents per kilowatt hour or $3.60. If we did this for a whole year or 365 days, the annual cost of using the LED bulbs to light the factory would be 365 times 360 or $1,314. Compare and contrast these two technologies. In one year alone, the factory would save 5,625 minus 1314 or $4,311 just by switching out the light bulbs. In an era of increasing manufacturing competitiveness and surrounded by countries willing to use nothing short of slave labor, we simply cannot afford to be stupid anymore. 
Add to this annual cost savings benefit the fact that a typical LED light bulb has a lifespan of 8 to 15 times that of a typical incandescent. There are gullible jerks out there quick to seize upon the disadvantages of CFLs and LEDs just because some windbag in the radio sold them a story about jackbooted government thugs breaking down doors to steal guns and light bulbs and force them to gay marry vegetarians. Yes, LED light bulbs are more complex to manufacture and they require special disposal procedures. I am not saying that they don't. What I am saying is that they use less energy because they're more efficient than a device invented in the late 1800s when horses carried children to their jobs in the coal mines. They are more complicated for a reason. As long as you dispose of them properly, and for crying out loud, don't eat them, a modern LED light bulb is a sure bet. Now that we've got a basic understanding of the efficiency of single-stage systems, let's examine the efficiency of multi-stage systems. Oftentimes, systems don't work in isolation, but rather as interconnected subsystems where the output of one stage is handed off to the next. Consider a system designed to lift a car so a technician can work underneath it. As a simplification, the system can be thought of the motor prime mover, driving a coupling, the coupling driving a pump, and a pump driving the hydraulic system and actuators, which actually lift the car. Starting at the motor prime mover, the input of the motor is electrical power, and the output is rotational mechanical power in the form of rotational speed and a twisting force known as torque, and losses may take the form of heat or noise. The rotating mechanical power of the motor is transferred to a pump shaft via a coupling. Not only does the coupling compensate for misalignment between the motor and pump, it allows the pair to be taken apart for repair and service. In this case, the input of the coupling is rotational mechanical power, and the output is also rotational mechanical power, and losses might take the form of heat, vibration, or noise. The pump itself consumes the mechanical output transferred by the coupling and produces hydraulic power in the form of pressurized fluid flow. In this case, the input of the pump is rotational mechanical power. The output is hydraulic power, and losses might take the form of leaks, noise, or heat. Finally, the hydraulic system consumes hydraulic power of the pump to produce mechanical power output via an actuator known as a cylinder that applies a certain linear force for a given distance. Losses in the hydraulic system might include leaks, heat, friction, noise, and unintended pressure drops. Modeled in this fashion, you realize the initial electrical power input to the system takes a hit at each stage such that the final output mechanical power will be much less. Allow me to demonstrate. For the sake of simplicity, let's assume each stage has an efficiency rating of 80% and the motor is known to consume 1000 watts of real electrical power. Output of the motor is input times efficiency. Substituting in our given values demonstrates the motor produces 800 watts of usable mechanical power output and 200 watts is considered a loss. The motor's 800 watt output is the coupling's input. The output of the coupling is input times efficiency. Substituting our given values demonstrates the coupling transfers 640 watts of usable mechanical power output and 160 watts is considered a loss. The coupling's output is the pump's input. The output of the pump is the input times its efficiency. Substituting our given values demonstrates the pump produces 512 watts of usable hydraulic power output and 128 watts is considered a loss. The pump's output is the hydraulic system's input. Finally, the output of the hydraulic system is input times efficiency. Substituting our given values demonstrates the hydraulic system produces 409.6 watts of usable mechanical power output and 102.4 watts is considered a loss. This is the larger system's usable output that actually goes towards lifting the car. Rather than looking at the individual subsystems, consider the larger system as a whole. 1,000 watts of real electrical power ran into it and 409.6 watts of usable mechanical power came out. Taken as a whole, the larger system has an efficiency of 409.6 watts over 1,000 watts, or roughly 41%. While the methods I just demonstrated are reliable and do yield intermediate results, there's a far easier and quicker way to determine the efficiency of a larger system composed of multiple stages. The efficiency of a larger system is the product of the efficiency ratings of the individual stages. In this case, 0 0.8 times 0 0.8 times 0 0.8 times 0 0.8 yields a total efficiency of roughly 41%. 1,000 watt input times roughly 41% directly yields a usable output of approximately 409.6 watts. You note the efficiency of the larger multi-stage system is much less than the efficiency of any single stage. 
This is the consequence of each stage extracting its portion of losses from a given input. This is to suggest that a chain is no stronger than its weakest link. Speaking of weak links, consider the consequences of a failing coupling, whereby the efficiency of the damaged coupling stage drops to 30%. What's the output of the larger system? The efficiency of a larger multi-stage system is the product of individual stages. In this case, 0 0.8 times 0 0.3 times 0 0.8 times 0 0.8 yields a total efficiency of only roughly 15.4%. What's the total output? Output is equal to efficiency times input. 1000 watts times roughly 15.4% directly yields a usable output of only 153.6 watts. Again, notice how the efficiency of the larger system is less than the efficiency of the least efficient stage, in this case the failing coupling. While quick, this method does not yield intermediate results. If we're interested in the outputs of the individual stages, you'd have to calculate each stage's particular output. In the interest of curiosity, let's do so to see if these results match our earlier calculation for the larger system. As previously, output of the motor is input times efficiency. Substituting our given values demonstrates the motor produces 800 watts of usable mechanical power output as previously. The motor's output is the coupling's input. The output of the coupling is input times efficiency. Substituting our given values demonstrates the coupling produces only 240 watts of usable mechanical power output, and the remaining 560 watts is directed towards losses. This is a clear point of failure in this system. If you're troubleshooting this scenario, you might hear the coupling producing an awful, awful noise, and the motor or pump or both vibrating excessively because the misalignment or slip. Given the coupling is absorbing these losses, we might expect the coupling to eventually catastrophically fail, which if you think about it, is a much better option than destroying the motor or the pump. In this sense, the coupling is acting almost like a mechanical fuse that hopefully ruptures before any other more expensive component does. As we continue on through this system, the coupling's shoddy output is the pump's input. The output of the pump is input times efficiency. Substituting in our given values demonstrates the pump produces 192 watts of usable hydraulic power output. Yes, the pump is producing substantially less output than previously, but it's not the pump's fault. It's being driven poorly by the damaged coupling. The pump's output is the hydraulic system's input. The output of the hydraulic system is input times efficiency. Substituting our given values demonstrates the hydraulic system produces 153.6 watts of usable mechanical power output. We might expect the car and the lift to rise extremely slowly if it did so at all. Notice how both methods yielded the same final output. Looking at the larger system by multiplying the individual efficiencies yielded a quick answer, yet it did so at a loss of internal detail. In contrast, calculating the individual stage outputs yielded intermediate results, although it did so at the cost of much more time. Depending upon your level of interest, one technique might be more suitable than another. At the very least, they make great ways of checking your work, since both methods yield the same result. If it helps you to understand multi-stage efficiency, use the visualization that each subsystem represents a window that is progressively smaller as you go through from one level to the next. At each point, a portion of that stage's input is shaved off and lost to the following stages. What you'll find is that though each stage might be individually efficient, the whole system's efficiency is substantially less efficient than the least efficient stage. All right, that's about it for today. In conclusion, this lecture examined efficiency. We learned efficiency is a performance measurement that determines how much usable output is produced from a given input. We learned efficiency can never exceed 100% and output must always be less than input because of inevitable losses. Additionally, we examine the efficiency of multi-stage systems where one stage's output is the input of the next. We learned that total efficiency of a larger system is the product of the efficiencies of the individual stages and that total efficiency will always be less than the least efficient stage. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.